everyone. Uh, my name is Brendan Vaughn. I am the editor-in-chief of Fast Company Magazine, which is a publication, if you're not familiar with it, in the US that focuses on business innovation. Um, creativity is a huge part of what we cover, the intersection of creativity and business. So I was thrilled to be asked to moderate this session, which is exactly what, what uh, that, that's exactly what this session is about. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here with this uh, really impressive panel uh, and all of you folks. Um, so, um, Generative AI's potential to augment creativity um, and lead to previously unimaginable forms of creative expression um, is kind of been topic A since, I'll just put it on when ChatGPT dropped, but it started before that, but you know, that really was the kind of watershed moment that has dominated the conversation ever since. So um, I'd love to just um, sort of get into that, um, start with some of the, the really exciting possibilities around, from a creative standpoint, around what AI can do, uh, and then get into some of the complexity around that and some of the potential dark side of that in terms of copyright, um, intellectual property, um, creator rights, is a machine an author, these kinds of things. So. Um, before we get into that, I'm gonna introduce our panel uh, very quickly. Um, Krista Kim is a digital artist and founder of Techism, which is a movement um, that treats de technological innovation as an artistic discipline uh, and seeks to keep the human centered uh, in the creation of digital art. Um, Almar Latour uh, is the CEO of Dow Jones, the publisher of the Wall Street Journal. He is a career journalist um, who has been the executive editor of the journal. He has been editor in chief of the journal's Asian edition, uh, managing editor of wallstreetjournal.com. Um, we have Darren Tang, uh, director general of the World Intellectual Property, Re Property Organization, uh, which is the UN uh, Agency for Intellectual Property, um, Innovation and Creativity. Um, Darren's also an avid musician, we're gonna talk about that, um, and wrote a book on the history and culture of T. Um, to my left is Neil Mohan. Uh, he is the CEO of YouTube. He became the CEO of YouTube in February after being chief product officer for about seven years. He's worked at DoubleClick, uh, Google, uh, has sat on the boards of, of various tech companies. That's our panel. I'd like to remind everybody that if you post about this session, and I hope you do, please use the hashtag WEF24. Um, so let's get into it. Krista, let's start with you. Um, what is in store for the future of creativity when generative AI converges further with other forms of tech and media? Well, it's really exciting. I, I first believe that there will be a convergence be between AI, spatial computing, or metaverse, and blockchain. And what really excites me is how AI is going to break down all communication barriers. You know, we're talking in different languages, we can communicate with each other no matter where we are in the world. I think that is a, an amazing possibility. But not only between human beings, but between species. You know, let's, let's talk about talking to plants. The technology exists now. We can talk to plants, we can talk to minerals, we can talk to animals, whale species, dolphins. So, How can we do that? Tell, well, tell us well there are actual that. scientists who are developing this, using AI, to be able to understand and, and actually decode the language of animals. So imagine what, what kind of incredible information we have, and capabilities we have, for creative integration with the world around us. It's a whole new transcendent medium. And then of course you think about, what about the possibilities of integrating expertise? All kinds of expertise. You have incredible AI brains of experts in different fields all over the world. So if you wanna create a new project and you're a neuroscientist, you wanna create an exciting art project, you can consult with an AI artist expert and say how can we do this project together and then also make bring in sustainability into the into the whole concept so the idea of integrating expertise with information that's at your fingertips at the highest level is very in incredibly important for the future of like really creating solutions for the future as well yeah um darren let's turn to you um you know you were a semi-professional musician um before um before my dad told me, don't make your passion your profession. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> we're taking this day job. Yeah. So um, tell us about your um, excitement uh, around music and what Gen AI can do for music um, and just how you're personally yeah. excited to experiment with it. Yeah, well, you know, I, 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 I used to play jazz piano professionally um, when I was in law school. So that's remained close to my heart. I understand the challenges of musicians and creators. And I think uh, in the music sphere, right, musicians have always uh, embraced technology. You think about the time when, um, uh, you know, Blue Monday was dropped by, by a New Order, 
in the in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, you think about the uh, about the uh, you know the use of synthesizers and, and you know, electronic music. So I think this 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 potential that AI has to to add to what Chris is saying, you know, it's a tool for music, right? Uh, it's just part of that longer journey, right? Where musicians have been always using whatever tools they can to find new forms of expression. Uh, and I think that really seeing some of this, as you said, it's not new. It's been going on for quite a few years, but uh, it's, it's really exploded in the last one year. Uh, the Beatles just released a new song, Then and Now, uh, using AI. Howard Jones, who, uh, who you know, the music we grew up with in Howard the 80s, I'm yeah. revealing my age, of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, he said that we should not fear AI, but use it to, to you know, and he's created a whole chorus in the latest song using AI-generated versions of, of, of his voice. And Grimes uh, said that, look, use AI to, to create new music, but let me know uh, about these creations, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and we can share the royalty. So musicians are already beginning to react to AI and use AI uh, as a way of, of enhancing, augmenting uh, their creative capabilities. And I think this is just the beginning. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, music yeah. especially. I, I recently saw a demonstration of yeah. a, a fairly well-known musician uh, sort of just prompting AI to create songs and yeah. beats that you could then experiment yeah. with and do other things over. And it really did raise these fascinating questions about the creative process and, you know, is that music that this person wrote or created? You just have the idea in your head, you prompt it, all of a sudden it's there. It's a, it's a, the grays become really, really fascinating yeah. and fun to, to think about and play around with. Neil, I'd love to turn to you. Um, Tell us about what YouTube's got going on in this area um, in terms of both the, uh, what, what uh, visitors to the site who are watching videos can do and, and will be able to do in the future and what creators uh, can also do. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add to what was said. If, if you think about um, uh, you know, what YouTube is, it's, it's obviously this platform where a couple billion people all over the world come to every single day to connect with their favorite creators, and I, creators writ large of every form, YouTubers, musicians, artists, sports figures, Bollywood figures, what have you, really peop, creative people from all over the world make their home on YouTube because when it was created almost a couple of decades ago, it was the <clears throat> really kind of the first place where if you had a creative idea or a thought, you could share it with the world no matter where your audience and fans were without a gatekeeper you know, telling you that you didn't look the right way or sound the right way or what have you. And so if you fast forward from that sort of inception moment to where we are today, we're in a similar type of revolution where AI is going to further democratize that creative process. You heard you know, examples here uh, of some of those things. And so some of, some of what we're working on is really along those lines. And our mantra at YouTube is, AI should not be a replacement for human creativity. It should be a tool used to enhance all of our creativity. And so, you know, building on uh, Darren's point around music, um, one, of the, one of the efforts that we have underway is this music AI in incubator. And we bring artists through this, this basically this lab. Uh, it's a collaboration between U YouTube and Google DeepMind and we play around with new AI tools. And the analogy of a synthesizer or a drum machine is actually exactly the right one. And that's what the artists tell me every time they play around with this tools. So to give you a very concrete example, imagine a tool where you can go to as an artist, give it a prompt, a text prompt, saying, give me um, a chorus that's in the style of this type of an artist with this type of melody and beat and that's created right then and there. Something that they might have had to go back and forth on maybe for weeks with an actual chorus, um, you know, an instrument set or what have you. And so it's like a supercharger for their creativity. And uh, what artists tell me every single time is like, wow, I can create this music that a week ago I wouldn't have even thought humanly possible. And so those types of examples are incredibly inspiring. Another one which we just released um, in beta form on our product is called Dream Screen. So if you're a creator, um, you might just say to YouTube, hey, YouTube, give me a video with a dragon flying through Broadway in Manhattan. That, um, from a creator's perspective, would have probably taken days or weeks worth of work to actually create it. Now it's happening instantaneously. So they can take, take that video to the next level of creativity in a way where these tools are now accessible to people 
that otherwise wouldn't have even been able to dream about that type of a concept. And so that's the type of explosion that I expect to see on platforms like YouTube, of course, but really kind of throughout the world as a result of this technology. It raises fascinating questions about the role of talent in, in the equation, and I, we, maybe we can get into that if we have time later, but I would love to, I just wanted to point out a couple things uh, from that. It's so, the synthesizer drum, drum machine analogy is a great example of a larger theme of machines have been smarter than us in various ways for a long time, right? Like when we use a calculator, we don't say, oh, I feel so dumb because I use that calculator, which is smarter than me, right? So AI uh, has been around in various forms for a while. Yes, it is like you know, exponentially advanced in, yeah. in recent years, but um, this is the, the, the larger idea of a, of a machine being able to do things faster and better than us isn't new. We'll just have to get comfortable with it being able to do that on a much uh, larger scale. Uh, Omar, I'd love to ask you about um, journalism. So, um, you know, I'm a journalist, and what we talk about sometimes is, um, well, the stories that aren't much fun to do anymore, it, it have never been much fun to do, you know, can now be potentially done by a machine, and we can fact check it and, and, and put it out into the world once a human has made sure everything looks good. Potentially freeing up a lot of room for, um, the humans in journalism to do the kind of investigative work and much more complicated work that a machine can't do yet at least. So we'd love to get your thoughts on that and hear anything else that, that you're talking about at the journal in this regard. Yeah, well, in, in, in many ways, the, the themes that just came up apply to journalism as well. And I think as a, as a tool, it can be exhilarating uh, for journalism. In the area of research uh, right now, uh, you can, uh, if the central function of uh, high quality journalism is to reveal malfeasance in, in society, and, um, then we are already seeing examples where research can be done at a level that just simply couldn't be done before, processing large data sets. Um, so a recent example in a research arm of Dow Jones is um, um, a, uh, a human trafficking uh, organization was uh, uh, unveiled uh, in, in that it had a front um, uh, fake website um, that looked like a, an HR website, but because our researchers could go to uh, massive data sets and, and could compare those uh, to uh, the, the data that was on the fake website, they actually uh, hmm. could, could tell that this is uh, uh, run by human traffickers. And so doing more value-add research is going to be probably one of the biggest advantages. Now, in terms of uh, the, the, um, the, the, the trade-off of doing, doing away with the boring work, uh, we've already seen that AI, of course, has been around for a long time. A lot, a, a lot of our headlines are already automated. A lot of uh, simple stories are already automated, earnings stories and such, uh, often directly connected to computers and, uh, and trading houses. Um, that has not uh, taken away uh, jobs uh, from journalism has actually allowed journalists to focus on investigative work. And so I'm, I'm really optimistic about that. Also connecting with consumers, readers, uh, users in, in new ways, that's going to be very, very important. And I think it will proliferate and deepen the connection uh, that, that we have with the, the public at large. At a time when trust is really low, I think we can find new ways to, be, be, to become trusted. Yeah. Well, that's a good note of our overall theme this year of Davos of Rebuilding Trust. I'd like to stay on you um, for this next question, and Neil, if you could weigh in as well. Any other panelists, of yeah. course, is welcome. Um, but I'd love to, to, you know, business is part of this conversation, right? Products are part of this conversation. What can you tell us, even in general terms, about the kinds of products that this will enable that your readers, viewers, listeners will be able to um, take advantage of advantage of in the, you know, maybe the relatively near horizon and then perhaps further out. Yeah, what, what I can say for us uh, is that in, a, in the next few months, you'll see products coming out and um, uh, first uh, probably focused on co corporate customers. Uh, a lot of the products that we're going to launch uh, that are the generative AI related are driven by customer demand. Um, and so we're responding to a specific need that we see in a business, for example. Um, you'll see self-serve products, and so people can then extract d deeper information, um, uh, whereas before maybe it was more broadcast, so you're simply sitting there waiting for something to happen. Um, and so you'll see a, a category, of, category of products coming out. 
think new ways of uh, visually presenting um, uh, that will be a category of products. Uh, and then a simple summarization. Um, so those, I'll stick with the general categories because the products are not yet live, okay. uh, but uh, those will be highly commercial, um, will have a price, um, and we're very optimistic about those. Yeah, what, what, what about the price? Like, what, do you, what can consumers expect when, uh, I'm not asking for specifics, but like, this technology is not cheap to develop. The compute is very expensive to, to run. Um, this is, you know, why OpenAI had to change from being a nonprofit to taking money to do the work it wanted to do. Are consumers looking at um, yet more subscriptions um, to add to their list of subscriptions in order to access this kind of info? Well, in some cases, it can be rolled into a subscription price, and some, in some cases, it can be an individual uh, subscription. Um, yet more subscriptions. I, I'm a big fan of making sure that journalism is funded. Uh, we are 80% uh, of our revenue is driven by uh, subscriptions of some sort. And the value is not determined by the technology. It really shouldn't be. The value should be how deep does the information go? How useful is it to me? And so that's how we'll gauge the value. And by the way, that's not new for generative uh, at all. Right. We, we, the deeper a product goes in, in our world, uh, the more we charge for it. Um, and we find that subscriptions are just the way to go uh, there. Um, so, Neil, I'd love to ask you about the same question about products. Um, I'll, I'll tee up the NFL Sunday ticket um, thing, which started this year, where you t uh, the NFL uh, was available via YouTube for the first time. Um, there are a lot of possibilities creatively, um, I think, from the league standpoint and what they can do that you would not be possible on traditional broadcast. Um, but there's also a lot of possibilities for the viewer experience to be able to interact with their friends and multi-screen and, and all kinds of things. Um, some of that is AI related, some of that perhaps isn't. But um, we'd love to hear you talk more about that, sort of almost one season into that experiment and any other sort of products on the horizon. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk about it. I'm a sports nut, so I can talk about uh, Sunday <laughs> Ticket all day long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I'd take a step back, actually, first of all. So, you know, again, back to those two billion users that come to the platform every day. Um, we're a platform that generally skews young to younger users all over the world. Uh, and their expectation, if you think about how they've grown up, is they expect to see all the content that they know and love in one place from their favorite YouTuber, to their favorite musician or artist, uh, to their favorite sports, to their favorite movies, all in one place. Uh, and that is their expectation in terms of how they want to consume content. And um, so uh, that's really where Sunday Ticket fits in, because YouTube is everything from NFL games to you know 15 second shorts from your favorite musician kind of a thing. And um, so when the NFL looked at the partnership with us, what was most important to them was we brought this next generation of fans to the table, a younger audience. Uh, they wanted to do more with YouTubers and creators and artists because that's how younger people wanted to consume their content, those live games. Uh, and um, that's uh, empowering a lot of that experience on YouTube is AI. We're having a conversation about generative AI here, but if you broaden artificial intelligence in general, and if you think about your own experiences, um, all of us, with YouTube, when you open up that app, when you open up your phone, um, you see a ranked feed of recommendations that are your personalized interests. That is AI. That's, those are machine learning algorithms that actually do that, <clears throat> taking into account tens of billions of signals to give you that perfect feed of the content, which includes, you know, in my case, will include lots of sports, the NFL, the NBA, what have you, um, my favorite creators, et cetera. And um, so that's really the fundamental way in which AI fits in. I, I describe YouTube sometimes as the world's most efficient connector of a creative person and their idea with their audience, no matter who, where they are in the world. And at a fundamental sense, before we get to products and features, that's what the NFL bet on. Um, and, and so you start with that baseline, and then all the innovative stuff that you can layer on top of that. So for example, one of the features that was incredibly popular for sports fans this year was something called MultiView. And MultiView is a capability where you could watch four games at once on your screen, and it was device independent. You could, it was basically stitched together in the stream as opposed to something that was happening on a set-top box or on the, um, on the hardware device. And that is, 
um, the type of innovation of features that we can layer on top of that fundamental finding the perfect audience for the perfect piece of content. Um, and so that's, those are the exciting opportunities. In terms of your question around monetization, um, for us, it really starts with distribution first and foremost. You gotta build that audience before you monetize on our platform because we are primarily an advertiser-driven platform. So that's the way creators uh, make money on our platforms by connecting with an audience, and that's what we, and on top of that is when we layer on our advertising products. By the way, AI is an area where, within Google and YouTube, where uh, advertising is an area where we're also bringing a lot of AI innovation yeah. uh, in terms of ROI for advertisers and brands, and CMOs are most excited about the fact of connecting with that engaged audience on YouTube. Well, how does that happen? That happens through our AI-driven machine learning algorithms that find that perfect audience and creator and advertiser combo billions and billions of times a day. Okay. Um, Darren, I, yeah. I'd, I'd love to get your sense um, you know, from your global perspective yeah. of this. You know, we have these big players here, yeah. Wall Street Journal, YouTube, you know, on, on the smaller folks out there yeah. that are still Absolutely. doing you know, yeah. amazing yeah. work and excited about the potential. Yeah. Kind of what are some of the themes that you're seeing emerge there? Yeah. What, what, are the, uh, what are folks excited about? And, yeah. and also what maybe keeps them up at night? Yeah, so first I think as, the, as a UN agency, uh, I have my, my stakeholders are the 193 member states. And one of the things that we see as a big challenge in this area is that 2.6 billion people still don't have access to the internet. And of those that have access to the internet, right, uh, apparently 90% don't have enough computing power to be able to uh, be part of the AI, you know, and make use of AI as well. So I think that's, that's at the global level, there's a big issue on inclusion. And I think we need to make sure that we bring these people in as much as possible. There's a lot of work being done at the UN level. I think the, the Secretary General himself has taken a lot of personal attention to this. There's a high level of advisory board on AI. And, Wangapo was part of the conversation along with many other UN agencies because there are many different aspects of AI. There's the ethics aspect, there's the governance aspect, there's the you know, bandwidth aspect and all that, right? So I think you will see us doing a lot more work in this area. But I think that's something which I want to just bring up because, you know, we, 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 you know in our excitement about AI, right, we need to make sure that we also take care of those and bring them on board. And from a music point of view, from a creativity point of view, it's, it's a waste if a lot of people are not being able to access the AI system and technology right in order to put their creative work in, in the markets. And increasingly, with uh, music becoming more diverse, we, we've got Afrobeats movement, you know, we've got the, the biggest artist on Spotify for, for some time was Bad Bunny, as a, as a Latin American artist. So, so we have to make sure that we are, we, are, we are much more inclusive in this. And then, of course, in terms of the, the IP part of it, um, you know that uh, yesterday we had a session, I think knew you were there, we, we on, on AI and, and you know, and, and uh, Duncan, who's the head of the SAC after the Writers Guild in America, uh, was talking about how, uh, as part of the strike for the first time 40 years in Hollywood, right, uh, there were conversations about AI. And so there are real worries from the creative community, the creators, right, that AI could uh, not augment, enhance, but replace yeah. and put people out of jobs, see. And I think that that's where we really also need to pay attention. Um, we need to make sure that, as, as Krista is saying and many were saying, right, is, is AI continues to enhance the human-centered creativity. Uh, and I think that's very critical. And part of that is that there are big debates around intellectual property. Uh, when, you know, when, when Wall Street Journal creates new articles using AI, is that capable of corporate protection? Uh, when someone enters a prompt saying that, Let's write a new album where Frank Sinatra sings a new, the Beatles uh, songbook, and but that's trained using the Frank Sinatra, you know, catalog and the Beatles catalog uh, without permission from 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 these uh, uh, copyright owners, right? Is that fair? Uh, and here, what's happening in the world right now is that there's a lot of fragmentation. You've got different parts of the world dealing with these IP issues in different ways. And let me give you one very concrete example. In the U.S., the U.S. Corporate Office has said that if you use AI to generate content, and I'm simplifying a little bit, uh, we will not give you a copyright for that because uh, it's not you creating it. You know, if you're telling AI, please paint something in the style of Van Gogh but with Monet, it's not you doing it, it's AI doing it. It goes to a black box. The, in the US, that's not capable of copyright protection. But in China and in South Korea, uh, courts are beginning to uh, give copyright protection what's for, for that. In the, in the Beijing Internet Court last year, uh, the, a person is given corporate protection for AI-prompted artwork 
on the basis that he prompted and he was a prompt engineer. So that effort to put in the prompts was, was enough effort to, to give it corporate protection. I just found out that in South Korea, they just issued a copyright protection for an entirely AI-created movie called AI Lady Suro. And I'm not sure what it is, but you see there's divergences in this area. So I think what we need to do is that we need to bring the world together. And I think we're too early to try to harmonize. I think what's, what we can do as, as WIPO, as a UN agency, is to be a global platform, right? To bring all these actors, not just governments and regulators, but people like all of you in this room, the artists, the businesses, you know, and to come and talk and share best practices. And at least to, to have some beginnings of, you know, where is it that we need to pay the most attention to? And of course, in time to come, right? We probably will need some form of regulatory convergence or some kind of interoperability. I think that's where the world is headed. Yeah, so there's a lot, yeah. a lot to unpack there. I mean, the, the yeah. prompt, uh, the, 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 the AI prompt as creative act is a provocative yeah. idea. Yeah. Not sure how I feel about that. Um, would love to hear actually how you all feel about that. To the point of uh, Duncan Crabtree Ireland, you mentioned, yeah. who is the head of SAG-AFTRA yeah. um, during the Hollywood strike. Um, it, Duncan didn't say this, but one thing I heard said during that whole six months or however long it was when the, the industry was shut down was, uh, an example of like Christmas movies, you know, Christmas yeah. movies, highly formulaic, not hard to imagine at all yeah. that an AI could one day script and maybe even yeah. create a two hour, two and a half hour first cut or whatever of a Christmas movie. This is scary yeah. for the people that are still paid there in Hollywood a, to that, make Christmas movies. That was a brilliant placard during the strike that says that AI doesn't have childhood trauma. <laughs> yeah. So the belief is that AI won't be able to create, you know, some of these <laughs> game changing you know, uh, new genres of, of uh, but let's see, you know, uh, yeah. that's, that's really the, the, the where people, are, creators are feeling a lot of angst yeah. and a lot of anxiety. So we a move AI can scrape childhood trauma, right? Yeah, that's true, yeah, that's the, that's the counter argument and faster than anyone can, yeah. So. Yeah, well, no AGI until the machine has childhood trauma. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, We've moved into the policy realm, which is, is great. This is about time to do that. Krista, I'd love to turn to you. Um, what do you think of this idea that a, that, a, that a prompt can be a creative act and, and potentially protected by copyright? And sort of a related question that you can answer in the same uh, part is, uh, tell us, you know, creative agency is an important topic to you, yeah. keeping the human, uh, making sure that the human continues to have agency in the creative process, no matter how advanced the technology gets. I'd love to hear you elaborate on that. Well, I, I think it's um, it's actually uh, you know in everybody's interest across the board, whether you're a creator, um, to identify whether it's a human being that created this piece versus the machine. And I think everybody, the audience, wants to know that as well, and they have a right to know if what they're viewing or what they're consuming is made by a machine or made by a human being. And so I actually think that um, going forward, we have to look out things outside the box and start considering that our you know our digital identity is inextricably tied to our physical identity now. And so why not, why not attach our biometrics and create a digital identity like our heartbeat? I'm collaborating with a company called Tenbeo and creating an art installation using the heartbeat algorithm, which is unique to every human being and that is unhackable by AI, and using that to identify who we are and then, of course, verify what is made by me. So as a creator, when I create a work, I can use my heart signature to sign that and authenticate it. Or if I'm on YouTube and it's my, my podcast or whatever on YouTube, I can authenticate that that's me on YouTube. So with deep fakes and with AGI coming soon, we don't know when, but it's happening and it's inevitable. We have to distinguish between what is made by us, protect the humanity behind the creation, creative agency, versus the machine. Fascinating idea about putting those biometric markers into into creative work as a way to. You mean this strictly as a way to authenticate? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and would that live on? Wh where would that data be? St how would that data be stored? That's exactly I'd actually a good love to question. hear you answer that too. There, there, there are solutions that exist that allow people to use zero risk AI uh, language models. So right now, everybody, whether you're an institution or a human, you know, regular human. You're concerned about your IP being consumed into the aggregate AI model, right? But you want to have your own, you know, sort of protected AI model with your IP that's protected. And there are actually solutions to this that exist. And then when you can actually use your heart signature to then, of course, verify that it's from you, then that's zero risk AI 
And that's that's something that would be, you know, interesting here for everyone. Yeah, yeah just to your question <coughs> yeah. there, and I'm just building on that. What I would say is there's two pieces of um, technology that I think are important here, and there's various aspects of them that have been invented, and there's work still to be done. The first is, as Christo was saying, is what is the notion of that watermark? How does it live? And so an example of something that we have, I gave you that example of, you know, the Dream Screen product with, you know, the dragons and Manhattan, what have you. Another product that we've worked on is um, being able, it's called Dream Track, which is the ability to prompt YouTube. And uh, with an example like, um, um, have John Legend sing happy birthday to me. In, you know, and it's John Legend's voice, it's his typical melodies, and um, you know, he's singing a personalized song to me. Uh, we have a technology called Synth ID that watermarks it. And, the, and, and it's a watermark that's robust to slicing and dicing, which is really important, obviously. Uh, and I, I do agree with what, what Krista said. It is watermarking and therefore provenance is going to be in a really, really important concept to address some of these use cases of identifying what's machine generated versus human, for sure, but then also this other second use case, which is very important, tied to things like copyright, which is where the second piece of technology comes in, which is uh, attribution. And so in order to actually create real economic models, you have to have some concept of attribution. And sort of the most concrete example of that in the YouTube context, which is now something that is, I think, widely known throughout the industry, is uh, a piece of technology that we invented over a decade ago called Content ID. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason why we're the music platform that we are today, uh, because it gave certainty to rights holders, like musicians, artists, music labels, publishing societies, collection societies. Um, uh, the fact that their rights would be protected on our platform. And that's a watermarking technology. It's a means by which if you're using a particular song in your wedding video or your creative idea or your YouTube shorts, um, then uh, that is attributed back to the rights holder for that song and ultimately to the, to the artist or musician. And it does two things. It gives the artist control because they can ask for that video yeah. to be taken down. Yeah. But it also gives the artist the ability to leave it up and monetize it. And over the last three years, we've paid out on the order of $50 billion to the creative industry as a result of technologies like Content ID. And so provenance and watermarking are really important, but then also thinking about how you're gonna actually solve this attribution problem uh, is really important. And so that's why the analogy of things like Content ID uh, are important. And you know, we obviously have a track record of investing in that um, over the last decade, but I would say uh, that's something that we as an industry have to think about holistically as well. I, I couldn't agree more, and this also applies to uh, journalism on, on both counts, on the disclosure and authentication uh, toward the audience. So we're going here into an election year uh, where there's going to be a, a, an overflow of misinformation, disinformation. Creativity in the not good way. Uh, absolutely, it's and it, we're, we're seeing an uptick of that already, and, and that will be hard to fight. And so making sure that we can show the audience where does content come from, you can trust this, you cannot trust that. Collaborating uh, industry-wide or across industries I think is important. The other part, incredibly important for journalism, is the, the commercial aspect of this. If, if we don't have a um, authentication that can prove that our uh, hard-earned uh, reporting uh, or archives uh, were, were used in, uh, in, in generative AI and, and the creation of, of other uh, information products, then it's harder for us uh, to, to monetize. If, if that becomes yeah. uh, easier, uh, if there's an industry standard uh, around that, uh, then that will resolve one of the core problems uh, that we have right now in, in the in news and information service industry, which is, uh, is our IP uh, uh, being violated uh, by uh, uh, large language models, for example. Yeah, but New York, Times, New York Times has just sued OpenAI, and, 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 uh, and I'm sure... We've noticed. You've, yeah. You've, yeah, we've noticed <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I wanted yeah. to get into that. I mean, so the New York Times sued OpenAI, um, John Grisham, um, George Josh R. Martin, Martin Jody uh, Pico, yeah. Sarah, um, yeah. Sarah Silverman, the comedian, uh, Getty Images, I mean, so there's a bunch of legal action going on. Uh, it is extremely fluid. Um, there are also co business conversations happening around licensing deals instead of a lawsuit, perhaps even a lawsuit 
on the way to a licensing deal. I'm not accusing yeah. anyone of that by name, but um, there's just so much going on here and so many different ways that this could play out. Um, you're the most in the middle of this of any of our panelists, and I'd love to hear you just provide whatever context you can on sort of where you think this is all going. Yeah, well, I, I, where I hope it will be going is that there's gonna be fair compensation for uh, hard-earned reporting uh, over, over time. Uh, we are, as uh, we've disclosed, we are in negotiations uh, with various parties uh, that, that create large LLMs. Um, they, um, those negotiations are, are ongoing, so I can't really comment on the dynamic there. Uh, but the issues uh, underneath it are the ones that we've discussed. Um, so we have, uh, in the Wall Street Journal's case, or Dow Jones, 138 years of, of reporting that's accumulated. That's very, very expensive to do, uh, to uh, uh, provide that reporting, uh, high quality information over time. And so uh, when that gets scraped uh, and used in a different context, there needs to be a compensation for it. There are very classic models uh, for that. Licensing uh, yeah. is an age-old business. And so applying that forward in, uh, uh, in, in the AI era uh, is, is sort of where our focus is uh, initially. And then, uh, and here's why I would prefer to have a commercial solution rather than yeah. just going through the courts, um, which is a, a really a last resort. But uh, we wanna be partners in developing new new products, uh, we have to. If we want to unleash the creativity, if we want to improve the quality of journalism, if you want to spread reliable information uh, throughout society, you know, we're, we are going to have to work with the most cutting edge players to make sure that we have the right products out there, that we are meeting consumers uh, where where they are. And you know, if media goes it alone, um, then that will be slower. It won't be as effective. And so I'd much rather see a, a partnership happening. And you know, these are, I think, very solvable issues. Uh, but uh, ultimately, this is about value. Information has value. And high quality information has high value. And we cannot forget that. How does the, the, you know, AP and Axel Springer have both made um, licensing yeah. deals. How does that, those deals that got done, affect the landscape from your point of view? Well, so at the moment, it, 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 because we're at the very, very beginning uh, of this process. It, it's still pretty opaque what those deals uh, specifically entail. And so it's hard to extrapolate from that a conclusion for, uh, for the industry. Um, and so uh, that, that's sort of where we are right now. Um, and then we do know the spectrum. Either you partner or, or you uh, see, see each other in the court of law. Um, my, our preference is to, to to, to partner, but it has to be on, based on fair value. I, th I think the trend is headed towards collaboration and some form of detente in this area. And of, you know, it's absolutely right. You need to sit down with the tech companies, figure a way to make this work together. And, and what we're seeing in, uh, at my side is that uh, I think there's a trend in that direction. And I don't want to overuse the analogy, but there's, maybe we're facing a Napster Grobsko moment in this area where, you know, when, when, where, where after the dust has settled down with the litigation, uh, industry finds, different industry players find a way to come together and to, and to make this happen. You know? But what we're seeing right now is there's a big rise in copyright mediation cases. That's a huge rise. We've seen in WIPO yeah. a 50% rise in copyright mediation cases because people, apart from going to court, so I was trying to you know, get the license due, right? They want to sit down and mediate and, and, and sort these things out. So I, I, I see that as a, right now, that's the phase we're going through. I think once it settles down, right, there's probably going to be a lot of industry, you know, work and collaboration in this area. At least that's the way I hope and say it towards. And Brendan, I'll give another another example, uh, at least in terms of my experience, in terms of how this could play out. Um, and so I gave you that example of that Dream Track product, you know, John Legend, or you know, create yep. that chorus behind me, etc. That's ultimately where the creative product ended up. And that's super exciting, I think, for the creators and the musicians and all of us as fans. Uh, but there was a couple of things that needed to happen before that product could actually be put in the hands of creators and fans. And the first thing, one of the things that we did last summer as we were thinking about this was actually working with our partners, in this case, the music industry, the labels. And um, we actually issued uh, a set of principles. And one way that, that we could have done it is I could have just written a blog post and said, here's YouTube's principles in terms of how we will work with the music industry in this regard. But what we did was we actually 
co-wrote those principles. So it was, a, it was something that we published, in this case, with um, you know, Lucian Grange, the head of Uni yep. Universal Music, the largest label uh, out there, as a blueprint of a platform and the industry coming together and actually co-writing a set of principles by which this technology would be developed. And the music, the AI incubator that I described to you at the beginning of this conversation came out of those principles. And those principles were very simple, which is AI is here and it's gonna unleash all these creative opportunities, but we have to engage in it in a way that we address all of these creator concerns to, to what Darren was saying earlier around um, control, around uh, potential attribution. The most important thing, of course, that we learned through this process for artists was their voice. Mm -hmm. That's their identity. How is that something that plays into this? And then third, obviously, how do we do this responsibly, watermarking, preventing deep fakes, et cetera. And by, I found that by having a set of principles, in this case, shared principles, it allowed us to develop the roadmap and actually experiment with these technologies in partnership with creators and artists much faster because you understood sort of what the guardrails were gonna be like. And that's important because a lot of this technology needs to get invented over the next several years. But by having principles, it gave both sides permissions to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Good fences make good neighbors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A, a lot okay. of the principles you're speaking about is offered through decentralized layer technology. And, you know, interoperability and allowing smart contracts to basically accredit and uh, remunerate creators for their IP. I, I wonder if that's also, you know, a potential um, technology that you're also considering. Because it just seems like a, a really good enterprise solution. That makes sense. Uh, well, there is some thoughts that blockchain or distributed ledgers to get a smart contracts, right? Could be a way to connect the creator with the, with the uh, consumer and make the whole process of uh, royalty distribution a bit more efficient. I know quite a number of the collective management organizations exploring this area. Uh, I think there are technology solutions, but I want to make a pitch also for education and awareness because, uh, new, fantastic here you are pushing in this area digital ID, right? We find that many of the creators, especially in developing countries, don't even understand that uh, how to use technology and IDs and, and IP, right, to help them earn a living as a musician. So one of the exciting projects we have done at WIPO is that we're partnering with Bjorn from ABBA. Mm -hmm. He's got an NGO called the Music Rights Awareness Foundation. And we just launched this project called CLIP uh, last year in November. Uh, CLIP stands for Creators Learn IP, a free online platform to talk about the whole music making process from songwriting to, you know, to, to recording, you know. And, and how to make sure that when they upload a piece of music to YouTube, they, 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 they have the identifiers, how when they, you, know, you and your fellow artists are creating things, you have got the knowledge of IP right, to be able to earn a living and to keep creating. See? So I, I hope that more of you will join us on this movement, and I think uh, that's really what we need. We need to bring that awareness to the ground, because at, 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 at where we are in this forum, right, we, we are privileged to have that knowledge and the and, and the perspective, but, but many people out there just don't have that. Creators just want to create. And Bjorn was telling me that all he wants to do is just go in the studio and write songs, you see. Mm -hmm. And all this IP and all this stuff, is just hassle, is not, you know. So we need to help them to have all the tools to succeed as musicians. I as agree, yeah. and he's yeah. very passionate. He's talked to me about it yeah. as well. So yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great concept, yeah. um, and it does apply globally. I, I, I think that's incredibly important and, and commendable. I, 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 to make that work, we should also have an initiative, maybe through negotiations, yeah. uh, that AI platforms learn IP. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so yeah. Uh, looking forward to that. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, summing up here, we've got an enormous amount of excitement about the creative potential of generative AI. Um, we've got a sense of um, perhaps the technology being ahead of the regulatory framework. Maybe that's not quite the right way to put it, the sort of legal framework, both between creators individual creators and the entities that help distribute their work, as well as the larger media organizations and content organizations that are feeding the large language models um, that in a sort of a virtuous or potentially uh, less than virtuous in some ways circle, um, you know, can, can, can complicate the picture. So uh, we've got a great, uh, what I think is a, a healthy sense of optimism tempered by um, realism around some of those challenges that remain. And the next, it's, it feels like the next, uh, I mean, everything just seems to happen so fast right now, but over the next 
six months, year, five years, 10 years, um, you know, the Napster analogy. I mean, you know, hopefully we can find fair solutions um, in a way that doesn't lead to some of the, of the hard lessons learned um, by that chapter in tech history. So um, thanks everyone, this was a great Thank panel. You. I learned a lot, I hope uh, everyone else did and uh, really appreciate your insights and, uh, and, and smarts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.